words The cry of hearts Which love your name And with one voice We will proclaim
Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 22. It says, Now those who were scattered, scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to, one, to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, were, who on coming to the Antioch spoke to the, the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Uh, the report of, of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Over the next month or so, we're going to do a new study together. We're going to take a look at some passages in the kind of middle portion of the book of Acts. We're going to specifically be looking at a church that we're going to find was started in the city of Antioch. You know, I love the way Martin started this morning. He started off by singing happy birthday to our friend Noah, who does wonderful things. Him and his brother do wonderful things with their instruments up here to help us with worship, and we're so grateful for both of you. Thank you for your sacrifices. But as we were singing, you know what I was thinking to myself is that what we actually should be doing is this. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God has blessed you. Happy birthday to you. Because Martin is right. This morning is a celebration of what God did in the early church when he began it almost 2,000 years ago. This is the birthday of what each one of us today get the opportunity to celebrate. And this morning, as we take a look at this passage, the story of how the church in Antioch began, I want us to be reflective of all that God has done for us. And as a result of what he's done for us, what does that require of each of us? Just curious, when you first arrived here in Bucharest, for me that's i got to think back a little ways. I'm sure, Stan, you would agree that was a long time ago when we first arrived here. But when we first arrived here in Romania, when you first arrived here in Bucharest, what was the characteristics of the church that you were looking for? What was the character traits, the things that you felt like you needed to find in a local church? Maybe... You were looking for something that reminded you of your church back home, wherever it is that you come from. For some of you, maybe you just decided, you know what, this is the only good option that I have in Bucharest, and that's why I ended up here at the International Church. And there might be a few of you who actually might be saying, why is this really even all that important? You realize, friends, one of the most effective defenses that we have against the challenges that we see in the culture around us, against the sinful desires in our hearts, against the things that will want to discourage us and, and cause us to want to quit. One of the greatest defenses that we have is the body of Christ, is the local church. That's why, really, as you study the Scripture, you don't see any place in Scripture where it talks about Christians doing life by themselves. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. We need the body of Christ. We need each other. We need our brothers and sisters. Over the next few months, we're going to take a look at the early church, their responses to the things that were happening around them, and how it should be affecting each one of us. As we said, this morning is the celebration of the earliest portions of the church. And what a, what, what a better day to be able to discover what God was doing in the early church. As we do this, we're going to discover, if you will, the character, the traits, the DNA, if you will, of the early church. And as we discover that, as we find out what it was that made them who they were, what I hope we'll discover is, is who we should be, who God would want us to be here in the city of Bucharest in the year of 2024. A few moments ago, I was talking to you about this new opportunity that we have toward to possibly get into a new building. But as I stated a moment ago, and I would ask you again, 
Is it really all just simply about bricks and mortar? About having a bigger, nicer edifice? Friends, I would suggest with the early church, it had nothing to do with the building. It was all about the people and the people that still needed to be reached. What caused the early church to grow like it did was is that there was evidence of life amongst them. They could see the tangible signs of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit in their presence. It was vibrant. It was authentic. It was real. People would come and they knew that they were going to find answers for the things that they were troubled with in life because they were going to the source of truth every single time that they gathered together. Therefore, they were finding what they needed to live this life and to live it in a way that pleased God. So I want to ask, how can we do the same thing? How can we be that type of church here in Bucharest, Romania? Well, with that in mind, this is the question that I want us to answer today. And I want us to ask it, and then I want us to ask the Spirit of God to use His Word to help us to answer it. The question I want us each to ask today is, what was the early church's response to the mission of the gospel? What was their response to the mission that God had given them here on planted earth? To go into the world, to make disciples, to be those that were truly his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the rest of the world. What was the early church's response to the mission of the gospel? Well, with that in mind, let's ask the Lord to help us to answer that question. Would you join me as we pray? Father, I ask you today that you would use your word to communicate to our hearts. Lord, that's what we need. We need truth to pierce our hearts, to open our ears, to open our eyes, to be able to see this world the way that you see it, to be able to see our neighbors, our co-workers, our families the way that you see them. So that, Lord, as we do gain spiritual eyes, to be able to see those around us the way that you see them, that it might then compel us to live out the mission that you have given us, to go and to make disciples, to take the good news, to preach it to those who need to hear it, so that they too can find what we have found in you. So, Lord, I ask you now to use your word to create in us a vision, a vision of you, and a vision of how you see the world. And might it cause us to go as the early church went, and by your hand of blessing, by your power, might we see you begin to do what you did in Jerusalem, what you did in Antioch, and in the rest of the world. We ask you, Lord, to be glorified in these next moments. May everything that takes place bring honor to your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What was the early church's response to the mission of the gospel that Christ had given the disciples when he ascended back to heaven? I think you're going to see that they responded in two very specific ways, and as a result, this had a tremendous third thing that we're going to look at. We're going to see that it had a tremendous effect upon them as well. What was the first response that they had to the mission of the gospel? Well, you're going to see that they shared it. They shared the gospel despite the circumstances that were happening around them. You see, at that time, what was going on with the early church was is that they were beginning to experience opposition unlike at any other time. They were beginning to see things happen that probably, up until that point, they couldn't have even comprehended that it would happen the way that it did. But the events took place where things started to transpire that were truly surprising to them. You see a little bit of this if you look, if you're not already there, in Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 19 to verse 30. And if you are there, I want to start in verse 19 to get a little bit of sense of what it was that they were experiencing, what it was that they were seeing. 
In verse 19, it says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. You see, at that point in time, the events that were happening within the early church there in Judea, in Jerusalem most specifically, but within the region of Judea, was is that there was a persecution that was rising up that they had never experienced before. We see a little bit of that if you go back to the early parts of the, of the book of Acts. You saw when both Peter and John were arrested and they were brought before the Sanhedrin and they were asked to give an answer for why they continued to preach in the name of Christ. And you saw a little bit of that taking place, but it really took a turn when Stephen was arrested, he was tried, and not just tried, but he was martyred, as he was murdered by the religious leaders. It was at this point in time that the followers of the way, those who considered them to be followers of Christ, they knew that they needed to, so to speak, get out of Dodge. They needed to go someplace else because their faith was putting them under threat. Therefore, they leave Jerusalem. They leave Judea, and they start to go to places like Phoenicia, which is basically like the, the coastline of modern-day Lebanon. They went to this area, and some of them decided that wasn't far enough away, so they got on a boat, and they went to the next island. They went to Cyprus, and others went as far north as the city of Antioch, which is located in southern Turkey today. And as they did, they were sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, just as he had told them to do. They took the gospel mission with them. They shared it with those that they came in contact with. But why would they, as they went, only share it with Jewish people? Well, I believe, at least originally, there was a reason for that. You see, many of them growing up in Jewish homes, they had been taught about the, the law and the prophets, and they probably recalled the prophets' words in, in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6, where it says, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. Turning them away on the mountains, they have forgotten their fold. In other words, the religious leaders were supposed to be shepherding the people of Israel, but instead they were not fulfilling their responsibility. And when Christ came, he came to correct the, the, the errors of the religious leaders and, and to lead people in a new way. And Jesus actually said, and they probably remember Jesus' words when he said in Matthew 15, 28, that I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And many of these people are putting two and two together. Okay, the prophet said that my people have been lost sheep. Jesus said that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And therefore, they're thinking, well, the gospel must be for Israel. So as they're fleeing Jerusalem and Judea, and they're going to Phoenicia, and they're going to Cyprus, they're going to Antioch, they're sharing the good news with every Jewish person that they come in contact with. But as they arrived in Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, they discover something that truly was surprising. Truly something they did not expect. It's the very thing that Peter actually references, the thing that he experienced himself while waiting in Joppa. And you see this actually a little bit earlier. If you go back a little bit earlier in chapter 11 up to verse 15, you see Peter talk about a time where he was waiting in Joppa and some men come and meet him there. And they say, we want you to go with us to the city of Caesarea. And when we arrived there in Caesarea, we believe that God has given you a message for those that were there. Listen to how Peter describes what took place once he arrived in Caesarea in verse 15. If you go back up in chapter 11 to verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. They were shocked. 
So this isn't just a Jewish thing. This is meant to be truly, as Christ said, for all the world. And they see this playing out right before their very eyes. These Jewish people who had left Judea, Hebrew-speaking people, they are now coming in contact with people that maybe don't speak in Hebrew. They're speaking in the common language of the day, which was Koine Greek. They're coming in contact with these people that were a mixture of, of Jew and Gentile. They were known as, known as Hellenists. These people were Greek-speaking people, and they're seeing God heavily at work amongst them, just as he was at work in Jerusalem. And they are truly surprised by what they see. They might have been wondering, how, how is this happening? I mean, do, were, were they possibly there at Pentecost when the Spirit of God came down and the church was birthed? And, and maybe they were a pilgrim that was there and they heard and they believed. Maybe somebody had carried it along to them earlier and they had heard and they believed. But clearly God was doing something. And they were surprised by what they found. They're even more surprised when they see God take it to a whole new degree. Take a look at verse 20 and 21. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus that we spoke of, and Cyrene. Now, Cyrene was a city on the, I guess you could call it the northern coast of modern-day Libya. These men, they had come together, and they had decided that God was compelling them to, so to speak. We, we think of Paul and, and Barnabas as the first missionaries. Actually, we have testimony here that there was missionaries that came even before them. <laughs> These men were being compelled to go from Cyprus and Cyrene, and they were being compelled to go to the city of Antioch. And God wanted them to go there because he was going to do something extraordinary. And who, coming into Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists, those who were Greek speakers, both Jews and Gentiles, living in Antioch, preaching to them the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Friends, I think there's a great lesson here for you and I today. Something that we need to take with us as a church family. Something that we must never forget because we do not know what God will bring our way. Over the last two years, we've lived through a time of war. And I think we all would agree that that carried its own challenges. And we do not know what God will have for us in the future. But as we look at what God did there in Antioch, I think we all can agree that God will grow his church no matter what you're going through. He'll grow his church in persecution, in hard times, in difficulty. But it is he that will grow his church. Just as the psalmist said, unless the Lord builds a house, those that labor, they labor in vain. It is God that builds the house. It is God that will grow his church. And that's exactly what took place there in Antioch. It wasn't necessarily those coming out of Judea, those who thought that they had right to the gospel, Hebrew speakers. No, these were Greek-speaking men who were compelled by the Spirit of God. They go to a Gentile city of Antioch, and they spread the good news, and the Spirit of God shows up and does something extraordinary. Men both of Cyprus and Cyrene going, sharing the good news of anyone and everyone that they could share it with. And God raises up a new church in Antioch. Friends, God will grow his church no matter what difficulty we're going through. No matter if we're in the midst of hard times. He will grow his church. This also shows me what drives the heart of our mission. Our heart should not be driven by the culture that we came from. Our heart should not be based upon our background, any tradition that we hold to. What drives our mission, what drives and compels us to go is the good news, the gospel. Why? Because it was the good news that illuminated your eyes, that illuminated my eyes, and it showed us our need for a Savior. 
And therefore, friends, can I suggest it's always the gospel that drives the heart of our mission to take the good news to the world. And that's exactly what these men did. They took the good news to Antioch that desperately needed to hear, and the Spirit of God showed up, and a new church was born. Jew and Gentile, united in one body, something unusual that had not been seen in Jerusalem, but was clearly seen in Antioch. Can I suggest the birth of the first true, real, international church of Antioch? <laughs> That's what took place right there. They understood the gospel was not just for Jews. It was for Jew and Gentile alike. And aren't you grateful that it was? If you are a Gentile who's been blessed by the gospel, can you say amen? amen. <laughs> it is wonderful that the good news is for all men. They understood exactly what Paul said when he was writing to his friends in Rome when he said in Romans chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on his name. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It does not matter about your tradition. It does not matter about your background. It does not matter where you come from. Jesus loves each the same. And he wants each to be part of his family. They responded to their mission, the mission of the gospel, by taking the good news and sharing it everywhere despite the persecution, despite the opposition that they were facing. Let me show you the second thing that the church in Jerusalem did in relation to their mission, the mission that they had been given by Christ. They promoted their mission. They promoted it by helping other ministries, by helping other churches. They promoted their mission by getting involved. For those in Jerusalem that were part of the Jerusalem church, what you're going to see for them, it was not about protecting their turf. It was not about protecting something that they simply thought belonged to them and no one else. No, it was all about the kingdom. Friends, oh, that that would be the case here at the International Church. That everything that we do be all about his kingdom and his kingdom alone. That we would be kingdom-minded in all that we do. You see, as the church in Antioch grew, the word of it spread all throughout the known world. People were talking about what God was doing there because it was rather extraordinary. There was something happening that doesn't normally happen. And you see reference to this in verse 22, the first part of the verse there. It says, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. Antioch and Jerusalem are separated by quite some distance. It's probably, I would guess just by looking at the map, there's probably several hundreds of kilometers between the two. But yet the word had spread from Antioch all the way to Jerusalem. And they're hearing about the extraordinary things that God is doing there. And as they're hearing about it, they've got a choice that they have to make. Decision time has arrived. The word had spread, kind of similar to an event that had taken place almost a little over a year ago back in the United States. Some of you might have heard about this. It hit the international press. A friend of mine has in the United States a son that attends a college called Asbury College in the United States. And some of you might have heard what had taken place there last year in the month of February. For 16 days, the young people at the college, they had gathered in the convocation center, and they started to worship God, and for 16 days, they didn't leave. They stayed, and they continued day after day after day. And people began to wonder, what is God doing there? And the news of that started to spread across the United States and started to hit the international press and spread around the world. In the same way, what was happening in Antioch, it was spreading all throughout that region. The church there in Jerusalem truly had a choice to make. Would they support their Greek-speaking brethren who were doing things that maybe were a little different? But people were being reached. Lives were being changed. A new church had risen up. 
Would they support them or would they oppose them? Because what they were doing truly was different. Friends, through the years that I've been here at the church, we've had similar decisions to make. I recall when we first moved into this building, shortly after moving into this building in 2009, about a year later, a group of Romanian people who had started a new church came and asked, is there any possibility that we could partner and, and use the space to worship? And as some of you know, we have a Romanian church that meets here in the building at 6 p.m. each Sunday evening. And it all became, that all happened because as we gathered together as leaders, we prayed and we said, Lord, what would you have us to do? And we agreed without one abstention that we need to be kingdom-minded. We need to do all that we can to say, you know what? We stand with you for the gospel. And we invited them to come in. A few years back, our friends in Nepal came with a similar request. And they started worshiping here, as some of you know, on Sunday afternoons at 1.30. And God's blessed their work. And recently, our friends from Ethiopia came and had the same request. And they've started to worship in here on Saturday evenings. Now, certainly, that creates challenges. The walls in here are a little more marred than they once were. Things occasionally get broken. As those who cleaned the building yesterday can attest to, things accumulate and, and they have to be sifted through and gotten rid of. But friends, I don't know about you. I would rather be right in the middle of what God is doing. If it creates a mess, then so be it. Those are not dirty marks on the walls. They're badges of honor. Because we're partnering in what the God is doing and, and how he's growing his kingdom. Yes, things might be a little different than how we do it. It might cause some of our traditions to get challenged. It might bring some new things into the building. But if lives are being changed and the kingdom of God is growing, then glory be to God. Amen? Amen. We should agree with that. We should want to be part of that. I wonder, had we been part of the church in Jerusalem as they were hearing about the church in Antioch, how would we have responded? Would we have responded the same way that they had responded? I'm reminded of this verse that I've actually challenged my girls with many times. It was a proverb that Solomon gave many years ago. It's found in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. It says, where there is no ox in the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of an ox. You know, it's nice to have a clean space. And that's why we do gather together occasionally, have a spring cleaning to clean things up. But friends, if all you have is a clean space and no people, nothing's being done. There's no crops being gathered. There's no fruit being born. There's no lives being changed. I would rather use this place for a youth group that's exploding the walls than to let it sit empty all week just to simply keep it pristine. Friends, we want to be right in the middle of what God is doing just like the Jerusalem church was right in the middle of what God was doing in Antioch. And let's see what they did. Verse 23. How did they respond? When he came... Uh, excuse me. Go to verse 22. The, 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 the report had got all the way to Jerusalem. And what did the church in Jerusalem do? They sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now, it's important to note who Barnabas was. You don't want to miss who Barnabas was here. Because it's important to see his character, the person that he actually is. If you go all the way back to Acts chapter 4, you see there that this was a man who was generous, who was willing to give of the most valuable things that he had to bless other people. In Acts chapter 4, it says, Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he was a Levite, a native of Cyprus. He sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money to the apostles and laid it at their feet. Now, it's important to understand what was going on there because Levites didn't own property, yet Barnabas did. Now, there's some debate where was this piece of property? Was it there in Judea or was it back in Cyprus? We don't really know. But if, as a Levite, he owned property, this would have been a very valuable thing that he had control over. 
but he willingly took it and sold it to bless others, demonstrating just how generous this man was. We see his heart to help. We see his willingness to get involved a little bit later in Acts chapter 9 as Saul had come to Christ by seeing the living Christ on, on the Damascus road. He comes to Jerusalem, and as Saul comes, he tries to engage with the disciples, but they want nothing to do with him. Who was it that helped Saul come and have a relationship with the disciples? Take a look. Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, when he, speaking of Saul, had come to Jerusalem, Saul attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him because they had known who Saul was before Christ, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But notice who entered, made the introduction. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road of Damascus he had seen the Lord and spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. He had a track record of getting involved, of helping those that were in need. He was generous. And we see a little bit of his character if you jump down to verse 24, the first part of verse 24 there. It says, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Why do I give you Barnabas's resume? I give it to you because it's clear that Barnabas was a leader in the church in Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem had that choice to make, are we going to get involved in what's happening in Antioch? They don't just simply send nobody. No, they send their very best. And friends, might I suggest if we're going to make a difference in the kingdom of God and what he's doing around us, it will require of us that we give our very best as well. Barnabas, when he first arrives in Antioch, he sees what God is doing. Verse 23, when Barnabas came, he saw the grace of God, that, it was, that his grace was working both among Jew and Gentile, and he was glad about it. He wasn't taken back by it. He was rejoicing in it. And he exhorted those there in the church of Antioch. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with the steadfast purpose of the gospel. He rejoices over God's gracious work amongst Jew and Gentile alike. He encourages them not just to continue doing what they're doing, but to do more of it, to reach more people. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged by those who says the gospel is only for the Hebrews, only for the Jews. No. Instead, just keep on going. Keep plowing forward. Because if you do, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. And you're seeing evidence of that as you continue to serve here in Antioch. God is blessing you, so keep going. He encourages them, keep on going. It's similar to what Paul said to those in Galatia when he said, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. He encourages them, keep doing what you're doing. Keep taking the good news to every man because God is blessing you and he's growing a church. He was essentially saying something that I say to my family often. Don't doubt in the dark, in the difficult times, in the times when people try to discourage you. Don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Take the good news to Jew and Gentile alike and let God do what he's doing here in Antioch. Let him build a church. But then Barnabas doesn't just Encourage them. Look what else he does. If you look to the second half of verse 24, yes, he was a man who was good, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. It also says, as a result of him coming, that a great many people were added to the Lord. I take that as if Barnabas didn't just go and watch. He didn't just go and take a seat on the sidelines. He actively got involved in the work of ministry. He actively got involved, and he says, I want to be part of this as well. And he got involved, and he saw Jesus' words come to fruition. You might remember what Jesus had told the disciples the night in which he was betrayed. In John chapter 14, he says, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and even greater works than these will he do. 
What was he saying? Jesus shared the gospel. He shared the good news of the kingdom. He shared it with those, and he called them to repent, and there were people who did. But the work of the apostles literally transformed the world as we know it. Literally, what did they do? They took the good news to the world, and as a result of it, people's lives were changed. I don't know if I lost the screen there. If somebody can punch that back up for me, I'd be grateful. Barnabas took the good news to all who needed to hear it. And the words of Jesus came true as they heard, they believed, and lives were changed. God grew up a church right there in Antioch because of the involvement of the church in Jerusalem. Friends, I wonder, as God continues to bring us opportunities to make a difference here in Bucharest, will we respond the same way as the church in Antioch? Will we respond by saying to the world around us, we want to do all that we can to partner with what God is doing amongst you? Yes, it will require of us our very best, but I believe if we are willing to do that, we'll see Jesus' words come to fruition. Whoever believes in me will not only do what I have done, but they'll do even greater things. We can see God do exceedingly above and beyond anything that we could ever think or imagine here in Bucharest. Well, as a result of the church in Jerusalem's willingness to take the good news to anyone and everyone who needed to hear, in spite of opposition, in spite of hard times, as a result of the church in Jerusalem's willingness to partner with their friends in Antioch by sending the very best that they had, by sending Barnabas, God then does something extraordinary for the church in Jerusalem. You see, the church in Jerusalem, as a result, they experienced the blessing of their love, the love that they had expressed to their brothers and sisters in Antioch. And I want to show you how that happened. Barnabas, as he continues to serve there in Antioch, he sees the church is growing, it's bursting at the seams, and they need help. There's so many people coming, he can't do it all by himself. So he goes and he seeks for qualified help that can assist him in the work. And he goes to the city of Tarsus to find Saul. We see him refer to that in verses 25 and 26 where it says there, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. This was Saul's hometown. What a better place to go and find him than the place where Saul was from. But why search for Saul of all people? Yes, he's trying to find qualified help. So why Saul? Saul was the one who had been persecuting the church. So why search him out? Well, we know Saul had had a marvelous, miraculous transformation that took place when he encountered the living Christ on the Damascus Road. He not only had an incredible transformation... But we also know from Philippians chapter 3 that he was an expert in the Levitical code, in the religious law, that he had a deep knowledge of Judaism. But he didn't just have a deep knowledge of the the Jewish faith. He also, as a result of his transformation, was preaching the good news to everyone. We see evidence of this in Acts chapter 9, verses 19 and 20, when it says, For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Remember, that's where he had met Christ on the Damascus road. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. He's no longer persecuting the church. No, he's doing all that he can to promote the church. So once he finds Saul, he brings him with him back to Antioch to help in this church that is exploding. And we see in the last half of verse 26 that they spent a year there ministering amongst the church. And as a result of their ministry, teaching a great many people, many people became disciples of the master. And an interesting thing happened. They started to receive a nickname as a result of what God was doing amongst them there. They started to call them, for the very first time, Christians. Now, we're kind of used to that name today. We kind of think that that's not a big deal. But one of the things that's really fascinating about the fact that they were first called Christians there is that 
When you actually understand what the name Christ means, it was Christ's messianic name, which means the anointed one the anointed one, they were taking his messianic name and they were putting it with those who were followers of his. So they were simply saying, Christ ones, Christians. They're making those to be the new name for those that are followers of Christ. So they gave them the nickname of the one that they were following. That's why they called them Christians. It's, it's kind of similar to those of us who like to follow our favorite sports teams. If you find somebody who is a, a fan of a particular team, whether it's a... a, um, a, a you give me, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a sports team here. In, in, I'm sorry? Barcelona. Barcelona. There you go. Whoever your favorite sports team is, I like the Cowboys in the United States. I know Martin likes the Chargers. I know that each one of us, we all have our favorite sports teams, but if you talk about one person, you tend to call them a fanatic. But when you go to a stadium of that particular team and you see a whole stadium full of them, they don't just call them fanatics. They call them either Chargers fans or Cowboys fans or Barcelona fans because they're all supporting one team. In the same way, there wasn't just a few of these because the church had grown so much and they had gained such a reputation. They're now calling this church full of people Christians. And it's interesting what happens because of what God is doing there amongst them. They hear about an extraordinary situation which is taking place back in Judea, back in Jerusalem where Barnabas had come from. And Antioch now has an opportunity to love the church in Jerusalem in the same way that the church in Jerusalem had loved them. Friends, I'd like to suggest that one of the reasons why we love our brothers and sisters the way that we do, why we get involved in the work of the kingdom, why we do all that we can, even if it gets our hands dirty, to promote the mission of the gospel. The reason we do it, one of the main reasons that we also do it is because we'll be blessed ourselves by serving others. We'll be blessed as we make a difference in somebody else's lives. We'll be blessed by that. Can I show you how the church in Jerusalem, they saw this take place? If you look at verses 27 and 28, it says, now in the days, in those particular days, in which the church in Antioch is exploding, it's growing. There's a lot of things happening there. In those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem. They came down from, remember, Jerusalem's up in the mountains. They came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of these prophets named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Claudius Caesar. This was a famine that severely affected their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, in Judea. And those in Antioch heard about what was happening back there, and they wanted to make a tangible difference in the lives of those that were being affected. So look at what they do. The disciples there in Antioch determined every one of them according to his ability... Some had more money, some had less. Some had more things, some had less. But according to their ability, they sent relief to their brothers that were living in Judea. Simply put, they gathered a love offering. They, 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 they gathered a, 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 an offering that they were going to take back to Jerusalem, back to Judea, to help those that were struggling. And notice who they sent it with. They sent that collection to the elders in Jerusalem by the hand of the very ones that had discipled them, by Barnabas and Saul. They did what Barnabas did many years before. They sold a valuable piece of land to make a difference in other people's lives. They learned well from him. They learned well from the one who discipled them. And now they're turning it all fuller circle to go back and to make a difference in the lives of those that are struggling in Jerusalem. Some of you know, as you've talked to me privately, that my father in the United States was in business for most of his life. And while in business, I remember once or twice sitting in one of his business meetings while he was training his staff, and he used to train those that would represent his company with this simple principle. He would say, take your clients and love them well for the first two, three, four years that you get a chance to serve them. Because as you do that, as you build that rapport, as you build that loyalty with your clients, 
He goes, something interesting will happen. He goes, they will start to develop such a relationship with you that over time, they will now start to love you back and they will take care of you for the rest of your life. My dad, as he not only taught other people in business to do that, he had seen that happen in his own work in the business world. Simply put, it's really truly nothing more than just a reflection of the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you. And that's exactly what the Antioch church was doing. They were reflecting the good gifts that had been given to them from Jerusalem, and now they're just taking it all full circle, and they're blessing them in their time of need as well. Friends, that's what we did when the war in Ukraine began. We decided we as a church were going to do all that we could to love those that were in need. Now, I don't know if it will come back to us full circle, but honestly, we don't do it just to be blessed. But as opportunities come for us to love others, we should do so, trusting that if we ever have a time of need, that God will raise up others to come and bless us. We should not be hindered from loving people well based upon concerns for the future. God's the God of the future. And he is the one who's in control. He says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. And we should trust that he will continue to do that if we are faithful to him. So we need to do just like the church in Jerusalem. We need to love those that we are partnering with in ministry well, trusting that God will meet our needs. Friends, I think we have a remarkable example here in the churches of Jerusalem and Antioch of who we need to be here at the International Church. I want to summarize it this way. As you take a look at both churches, I think there are clear signs here of what we should be. What are, if you will, the signs of a healthy, gospel-focused local church? What do those signs look like? I think you would agree. One, which we've seen, is that they had an unstoppable mission. There was nothing that was going to keep them from taking the good news to Jew and Gentile alike, that they were going to take it despite the opposition, despite the persecution, despite what was happening. They were going to take it to those who needed to hear it. They had an unstoppable mission. Not only did they have an unstoppable mission that was not deterred by opposition, they also had a kingdom mindset. They had a kingdom mindset that was not distracted by traditions that was not distracted by keeping a building clean, that was not distracted by complications of getting involved and getting your hands dirty. No, they were completely focused upon the kingdom, and if it meant bringing more groups into the building where things get more dirty and more things accumulate and more times we have to clean the building, they were willing to do it because the kingdom of God was growing and lives were being changed. They were not distracted. They had a kingdom mindset. And not only did they have a kingdom mindset, we, I think we've also seen is that they had a helping heart. That they were willing to take the things that were most valuable to them, sell them, to use them, to bless those that were struggling in the body of Christ. They were not deterred by the opposition. They weren't distracted by their personal agendas or by the challenges of growing ministry. They were not devoted to the things of this world. No, they were those that had a loose grip on the things of this world. They said, you gave them to me. I'm simply here to manage them, and if you want to use them to bless others, then may your will be done. Friends, as we conclude this first look at the church in Antioch, I want to ask you a couple final questions in conclusion. Because this won't mean much if we don't apply it to us here at the International Church. So can I ask this question in a very simple way? How are we doing? You think about those three things. How are we doing? Do we here at the International Church have a mission that is truly unstoppable, that we will not be dissuaded, that we are completely committed to, that there's nothing that's going to get in our way, that we're willing to take the good news to anyone and everyone who wants to follow Christ? Do we have a similar kingdom mindset that we're willing to sacrifice of time, talent, and treasure so that more lives can be changed? And are we willing to make sacrifices to help those in need around us? How are we doing? 
Many of you have your hand out this morning and on the back of it a lot of times it says there are additional notes and a lot of times it's blank. And if I asked you to take one of those faces and draw a face on there and how we're doing, happy face, we're doing great. Kind of flat line, kind of kum si kum sa or upside down, boy, things really need help. I mean, if you were to draw on there how you think we are doing, what face would you put on there? What would describe how you think we're doing as a family of faith? And after you make that evaluation, can I ask you an even harder question? A much more difficult question for each one of us. As you made that evaluation, ask yourself this. What was your role in that evaluation? You see, it's really easy to stand on the sidelines and complain about those that are playing in the game that they're not playing well enough. It's really easy to stand back and take shots at everybody else who's involved. It's a whole different thing to get involved in the game. It's a whole different thing to say, you know what? I don't have much, but here's my fish, here's my loaves, and I'm going to trust, Lord, that you'll do something with them. I want you to use me. Here am I, use me. What was your role in that evaluation of what's happening here at the church? The reason I ask that question is not to be harsh, not to be difficult. But the reason I ask that question is because Scripture is clear. Each of us are members of one body. And as members of his body, we all have an important role that we play. Some are a hand. Some speak with their mouth. Others use their eyes. Others use their feet. We all have a role that we play, and my question is, are you playing your role here at the International Church well? Are you fulfilling the role which God has created you for here at the International Church well? Because if each one of us do that, friends, there is no telling what God will do here in the city of Bucharest. What took place in Antioch 2,000 years ago, what took place on Pentecost in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, can happen here in Bucharest. The same God was the same God then as he is now. Would you agree with that? Amen? Amen. If you truly believe that, what role are you playing to see that happen? Friends, we all play a part in it. The question is, are we just standing idly by and watching others? Or are we saying, here am I, use me? The church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch didn't stand idly by. They got involved. And they saw God do something extraordinary. I don't know about you. I want to see God do something extraordinary in Bucharest. And I believe he's in the process of doing that. And I want you to come along with me. I want you to be part of it. Because I believe that the best days that God has in store for the international church are not behind us. They're in front of us. Let's do it together. We're better together if we will join arms in mission like the church in Jerusalem and Antioch. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the examples of the churches of Jerusalem and Antioch. And I pray that as you grow us here in Bucharest, that you would grow us with a same heart, a same vision, blessed by your spirit and empowered by you to do the same things that the churches there did. And Lord, if you're willing, may we see the same results here in our city. We ask you, Lord, to go ahead of us, to bless us and to use us, to take the good news to those who need to hear. And we pray this now in Jesus' name.
again while we wait for the screens to work. We will shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Grace again will 